Hi, this is Greg Remke, and this is a uh, free video link to the Mackinac Center Online Debate Workshops. This is the fifth presentation in the set of online programs. The first four are at the uh, uh, website that you'll see in a moment. So the Mackinac Center has a high school debate website, mackinac.org forward slash debate. We have posts on policy debate that are updated uh, regularly as well as links to online programs, as well as materials on the public forum topic, as well as policy. This presentation's on the policy topic, K-12 education. So here, though, I wanted to give a, uh, an overview. So again, you go to the Economics in a Cloud site. We've got the federal K-12 education reform with a focus on the economics and history of the topic. We've got four online presentations. You can see the list there, and you'll be able to click and watch any of those and we welcome any questions you have on that. But here though on the fifth presentation, uh, self-directed education, social mobility and employment. So these are more sort of updates and materials we think are relevant to students debating the uh, K-12 reform topic. And again the posts on the Mackinac Center site. Also I've got posts on uh, Debate Central. Debate Central, the Twitter, uh, their Twitter site, uh, and you'll see materials there. So these are links to recent posts on the topic. And one I want to highlight is, uh, you know, why in terms of education reform, why is teachers talking in the front of the classroom still the dominant mode of teaching? So article on that from uh, Ed Week. And people, they know from research of how students pay attention, think how their minds work, brain scans, that basically uh, 15 minutes is the reasonable amount of time to give a presentation. So if I go over 15 minutes in this YouTube video, uh, people will phase out if they don't before. In any case, brain research says grades 9 to 12 not exceed 15 minutes. What's relevant for this, if you look at the way education in most uh, schools is, is still done, it's mostly lectures except debate. So in debate, you're getting uh, short presentations, you're doing research, and you're making these ideas your own by thinking about them as part of a debate case or as a debate argument or a counter to other people's argument. So in a sense, one of the most effective education reforms could be taking the methodology, the effectiveness of debate, and taking it to other classroom instructions, that should be classroom instructions, could be the most effective reform. So US history, the Constitution, founding period, you know, why not debate it? The founders did, that's what the ratification debates were about. Current issues, debate, uh, adds a way for students to, again, uh, engage with the ideas, make them their own, and try and restate them or reorganize them. That's how you learn, that's how teachers learn, that's how debaters learn. So. Just an idea uh, on reform. Okay, what's the economic way of thinking? Economists look at the overall economy, the natural world, say we have scarcity. We don't have enough of everything for everybody. We don't have enough computers for all the classrooms. We don't have enough uh, money for all the uh, expenses we'd like to have in education. Uh, there's a cost. We make choices with the scarce resources we have. There's a cost to that, which is the opportunities for gone. If you're in your senior year in high school, you're giving up an opportunity to be, let's say, an intern or an apprenticeship at a company of some kind in the area. Which is more effective in your classrooms at junior and high school level, high, uh, junior, senior level, or being in the workforce uh, learning on the job in some way or practicing a craft, developing a skill? The opportunity cost of being in school is what you could be doing if you were out of school. Economics talks about supply and demand, the supply and demand of goods and services. We talk about substitutes. Um, is there a substitute for high school education? Sure, you could do online education. You can enroll in MIT tomorrow if you want to. Just go to the MIT website and you can enroll in uh, MIT Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology their online engineering courses. So every hour you spend in school has an opportunity cost. Every hour you spend working has an opportunity cost. Let's say homework you could have done, other things you could have done. Economists think about scarcity, choice, and opportunity cost. And they think about the substitutes that are available. You know, online education for in-school education, going to college instead of high school. Some high schools offer students a college degree at the same time they get a high school degree. 
they're enrolled in uh, dual enrollment courses. There's a high school in uh, uh, Indiana that works this way. So the background to this, in economics, we look at entrepreneurships, innovation, enterprises, and just like we don't know the best way to run a restaurant or the best way to make a hamburger or the best way to build a car, uh, we have a system that encourages everyone, gives everyone incentives to try and figure out better ways to deliver goods and services, to make better goods, safer, cleaner, more powerful, uh, more efficient, as well as better services, services that are easier to understand, more uh, valuable to consumers. This applies, again, to restaurants, clothing stores, you name it. It also applies to education. So we look for, in the K-12 system, a self-learning system where the people involved, the teachers, the, administrator, the administrators, the students, the federal government, the state government, are looking for ways to improve the quality of education and are uh, 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 trying to respond to changes in the outside world. New technologies, online education, smartphones, computers. What's the best way to incorporate these ideas in education to allow students to get a higher quality education uh, if possible faster. In economics, we look at institutions, the marketplace, the schools, churches, and we look at incentive problems and information problems. So in Europe, for example, in much of Germany, churches are paid for by the government, so people don't have to donate money when they go to church. But the problem there is the people that run the churches have limited incentives to serve their customers, the people that actually go to church. So in Germany, you've got these beautiful churches and funding from the government, but people don't go to church. In America, you've got competition between the churches. They're trying to figure out better ways to draw people into their churches. And that competition, that dynamism, draws more people to church than otherwise would be. Now, again, you get church services that seem crazy to old timers like me, but that's the way things are. But you're trying to appeal to customers. Same with restaurants. New restaurants, new menus, new foods, you're trying to uh, get more people in your restaurant and you're constantly changing as the interests of your consumers change. We want that sort of system in education where the people running the schools, the people teaching, have incentives to use the best technologies available, the best strategies available like Khan Academy and flipping the classroom. We talk about these in the other videos and I will later in this one as ways to improve education. And we have information problems. We don't know the best way. We don't know the best way to run a school. Uh, information is distributed. And what we want is a system that mobilizes information, that gets people to work together, that coordinates, that somehow finds a way to discover the best way to provide individualized instruction uh, as students uh, want or the students respond to. So food and food for thought, again, innovation and competition, that's how it works with restaurants. And that's how it could or should work with schools. We want uh, ways for schools to respond uh, in, uh, as if they would lose their customers if they didn't provide the best services they could. So we're applying economic topics to debate topics. That's what economic thinking my organization does. And the Mackinac Center online videos is looking at various ways to do this. Education is seen by economists as a way of investing in human capital, of improving the productivity, the capability of uh, uh, people to uh, earn more in the workforce and provide more valuable goods and services to others. So here's a number of sort of l quick looks at the topic. Uh, the credit hour, Andrew Carnegie setting up the time-based credit hour for college and for high school learning. Uh, this is supposed to be a proxy. I mean, why do you have to go to school three years or four years? Why not two years in high school? What we care about is what you learn. Uh, we shouldn't care about just the number of hours you spend learning. So we've got an over-reliance at the college level in the credit hour for awarding academic credits. And similarly, at the high school level, we've got the number of hours that a, you're sitting in a chair is the measure of what it takes to get out of school. But it should be what you learn rather than the time you spend. So. The argument is this isn't working, this sort of Carnegie uh, hours in the chair, time-based credit hour. So ways to reform that is what's discussed in this article and others. Now, switching gears a bit, here's another way to look at the topic. This is from the Washington Post. This is a major problem in 
the transformation of the American uh, job market in requiring more people to get a bachelor's degree that didn't used to have to get a bachelor's degree. So economists call this a degree inflation and it's spreading across the business world. A lot of positions you didn't used to have a college degree, but now it requires a college degree. Dental hygienists, photographers, claims adjusters, freight agents. When you look at these people in these businesses today, uh, most people in them don't have college degrees, but all the new people they're hiring must have college degrees. The challenge there is when the college students get these jobs, they don't like them. They're, uh, they're not suited for their education, and the people that would be suited, they can't get the jobs because they don't have a college degree. So we want a better way for the high school system to prepare and allow students to get these sorts of positions if they want them without the college degree. This is, again, a study from Harvard Business School, uh, looks at the number of unemployed, and yet at the same time, they, businesses can't get these mid-level positions, they can't find people, and again, they're looking at this degree inflation stuff. Oops, sorry about that. So you can see the link there, and we'll have a separate sheet so you can just click these links and get to them. Again, degree inflation, uh, a significant problem in the status quo. One way to reform high school education would be to better track students who are able to move right from high school into these jobs. Of course, they can still continue their education online or evenings or back to school later, but this gives them, people who don't really want to go to college, a way to get go from high school into the workforce without being stuck, needing to um, go way into debt, getting a college education for jobs that shouldn't require a college education. So again, this is more on that discussion. Um, so here's a, another look at the same subject. This is about a Catholic school uh, network in uh, uh, Chicago. And this school opened in a low-income neighborhood in 1996, had a work-study program to allow students to uh, earn income to help pay for the tuition. But what they found was that this work experience didn't just help students earn money. It was key in that their test scores, test scores rose significantly, as did the number of students applying to college. In other words, in this case, it looked like uh, working was key for students here not only to make some money to help cover tuition, but also to improve their ability to perform well in schools. Again, their test scores went up. And this is part of the debate story I told earlier. They're learning ideas in school, but not just sitting in the chairs. They're out in the workforce learning things firsthand. And so that combination of active learning seems to be effective uh, in this case and in a number of others that are mentioned in the uh, the other four videos, we look at a Chicago school that has uh, inner city kids working in various businesses. It's, a, it's an innovation that should be a major part, or could be a major part of K-12 reform. Oh, uh, Tanzania uh, this fall. Okay, um, another interesting idea. Some schools are abolishing homework, saying that homework for young kids is not a good idea. They're better off just reading. Uh, younger students that are stuck with homework, reading novels, stories at home is better for them. So this looks at the students, you know, doing best in the world, don't have homework. So reform, abolish homework, that sounds exciting, uh, looks particularly for younger students. Recess, get more recess. 40% uh, 40, 40 of U.S. schools have reduced or eliminated recess. Resource, recess turns out to be key for students. Physical activity is linked to better academic performance. These students gain key socialization skills. Uh, research on play is key. So this free time develops all sorts of skills that sitting in the classroom doesn't. This is a reform that you could push for K-12 education, particularly at the younger levels. Students. Now, this is a key area where uh, our system now, you know, you're in a class, you learn stuff, you take a test, you get 80%, 90%, and you move on. But competency-based education says, uh, regardless of how much time you're in the class, what matters is what you learn, and you should learn 100%, not 80, not 90%. So. Uh, the idea that students are advanced with limited knowledge, we don't have to do that anymore. Khan Academy people talk about this. Um, what happens are people are moved forward when they don't master the core concepts completely and then they stumble later. Uh, this next is a video that I'll link to that talks about competency-based education. And I'm, you can see this on your own, but the idea here is the 
you know, here's a, uh, people believe they're based ready for college, they're not. So more on the video. Um, also linked to this Khan Academy using uh, video to reinvent education. Uh, Salman Khan, you can read more about that and I'll link to that. But the idea there is uh, the tests don't certify people have learned key concepts. When you go Khan Academy, you do, you know, test up, you have to get 10 questions, you have to get everything perfect before you move on to the next level. And that's to better measure what people understand. And he talks about why this is important, at least in the STEM courses in his uh, uh, TED video. Okay, I'll end here. This is uh, XQ Super School, and you can go to their site, and they're basically saying we need to reimagine schools, we need to move beyond kids sitting in chairs, and there's the link to the YouTube video. You'll find the video at their website as well. And uh, the argument is we're, we're searching for better ways to find schools. We want innovative systems. This is one of many programs that is looking for ways to uh, discover better ways to dynamically improve uh, American schools. Okay, thank you very much, and if you want to learn more, the other four, just register, you can see the other four videos. Thanks.